You're listening to Policy Room by SPRF. On International Women's Day 2020, the Communist Party of India released a list of 22 martyred women carters as a way to applaud women's contribution to the cause. This restarted the conversation around the role of role female Maoists play in the conflict, reminding us that women maintain a substantial 60% of the total cadres and occupy almost all operational and tactical positions responsible for sustaining the rebellion. In light of this, we discuss the Maoist conflict from a gendered lens. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us on today's podcast. I am Ria Singh Rathor, Research and Editorial Coordinator at SPRF, here with Dr. Heidi Riley. Uh, Dr. Riley is currently Adjunct Research Fellow at University College Dublin and King's College London. Her research explores gender relations in armed groups and policy level implementation of United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325. Her forthcoming book is titled Masculinity, Ideology, and Change in the People's War in Nepal, where she discusses her fieldwork and research on the context of Nepal's Maoist conflict, and it will be published later this year. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Riley. Thank you for the invitation. (laughs) Very pleased to be here. Oh, that's great. Okay. So let's begin with the fact mentioned earlier that women form 60% of the Maoist forces, with some recent estimates even suggesting 70%. What I particularly want to get your view on is that despite the reality on the ground, female Maoists are particularly discussed as misguided innocent victims of male Maoist recruiters who only use women as bullet shields or foot soldiers for their own benefit. This coverage of women suggests that female Maoists have no agency in being involved in the armed rebellion, but still compose 60% of its fighters. Can you shed some light on this line of thinking, where it's rooted, and if it's even true? Well, thanks for the question. That's certainly an interesting one. And I think it's an important question generally with regard to how we perceive women in society, particularly um, from an intersectional lens, how we perceive women combatants often as those that come from marginalized groups. But also one of the problems with this position, this idea that kind of women are the innocent victims of armed groups, uh, really is problematic from the perspective that it's actually incorrect in many um, ways, but it also perpetuates this idea that women are the perpetual victim and that men are the perpetual perpetrators, which in itself has structural implications of how we perceive women's roles in in society. It also perpetuates this idea of just the instrumentality of women and I suppose ideologies that are more um, kind of gender inclusive. Whereas I think there's a need to problematize this way of thinking. Now, if we take this example or the statistics rather that uh, you mentioned of of 60% of the armed uh, forces um, within the Communist Party of of India, Maoist, are women, I think this needs to be problematized somewhat. So first of all, often this is a kind of media like image, you know, it's a big, you know, shock. 60% of forces are women. Now, I'm not entirely sure how accurate those figures are. I would say that they need to be nuanced somewhat. Are we talking about women combatants or are we talking about also women in support positions? Also, what does it do for the image of the armed group itself by using propaganda that um, identifies um, 60% of the forces of women, because it actually creates an impression of what the armed group is, that it's inclusive of, of women. But at the same time, from another perspective, this is often seen as something as shocking, and therefore women can't have any agency in joining armed groups. Well, we know from research in India, but also in other armed conflicts globally, particularly Maoist insurgencies, 
that women often agree to participate or seek out participation for multiple reasons. And the idea that women are always coerced. Now, we have to look at coercion, of, of course, from an, a number of perspectives. There's direct coercion, that the armed group is coming and actually physically taking those individuals you know, or ki- kidnapping those individuals. No, certainly that takes place. There are n- numerous uh, stories of Maoists kidnapping, particularly young girls. But at the same time, there are also numerous stories of Maoists kidnapping young boys. So it's not only women that are targeted in those kidnappings. We also have to remember that, yes, although many of the women make up the kind of lower ranks, there are some women that have had significant roles in in the Maoist. If we take, for example, Anuradha Gandhi, really, she was very instrumental in uh, reinterpreting the ideology of of the CPI Maoist um, back in 2007 when she was elevated to a position in the Central Committee. Now, it's true that women in leading positions in central committees, and I think that's very much the case across, well, across globally, but also in South Asia, that they're very minimal. We could say the same in, in Nepal, for example, where there was only really one woman um, who was in the central committee, and she was very much the ideologue, and she was the wife of the kind of the key Maoist ideologue in itself. So there was a kind of family connection mm-hmm. there. But they had key roles in the development of that ideology and how that ideology is implemented. So I think we have to take into account that, you know, and particularly, actually, if if we look more at Arundhati Gandhi, she was very instrumental in kind of new writings on the ideology of the Maoists, which had an impact in the upper echelons. And there are others who have taken combat positions um, and positions of commander who have their experiences is not necessarily one of being the victim. Now, I'm not saying that victimization doesn't take place within the the Maoist. It certainly does. There's a lot of documentation of sexual violence against women, for example. I'm not trying to say that the situation is rosy for women that participate in such armed groups, but the notion that they are only there as victims to serve their masculine counterparts, I think is problematic and has broader implications. Okay, I think uh, another thing that you mentioned, when we look at the figure of 60% or 70% of women, we also have to make sure that they're intersectional figures, in the sense we don't know who's occupying what role. I think that segues into a figure I found quite striking, which is that, you know, within also like the female cadres, those from SCST backgrounds suffered disproportionately when we talk about any sort of victimization or violence against women. The figures estimate that women from oppressed groups constitute 40% of the female troops, but 90% of the female martyrs. A couple of studies even show that the best predictor of Maoist activity was the presence of SCST communities in the district. Maybe you could chalk this out for us regarding how these figures translate on the ground. Why is there such a strong link between Maoist activity and caste discrimination or tribal discrimination? Yeah, I mean, I think also this goes back to an understanding of the root causes of participation and the root causes of participation, both for for, for men and and, and for for women. particularly within Maoist ideology, the focus on class-based ideologies is often used as very much a calling card to those from oppressed groups. And so high numbers of those from marginalized groups is representative of this. Now, if we look at kind of the reasons for participation in armed groups more generally, although there are multiple reasons, exclusion and marginalization, relative deprivation is one of those major contributing factors to joining an armed group. Also issues around state violence. So in response to state violence or community violence that actually participation in an armed group may be another option in a sense to violence that has been perpetrated in the community. And that of course, also involves structural violence, which women from minority groups tend to be targets of. Also, with the the shifts in the ideology, there is much greater focus on how participation in, in a Maoist group will challenge violence against women in a lot of the the, the propaganda. And that in itself is is a calling card for young women who have been victims or or potential victims of, of, of 
the violence at the community level of possibilities of being married very young. This is also part of the reasons for some women finding participation um, in an armed group more attractive is to escape from those sorts of conditions. And not necessarily that that might be sought out, but that ideology in itself is attractive. Now, if I think about my own research in Nepal, which some of the reasons for women's participation particularly from minority groups, from the Dalit community, was around that exclusion in the community that, in a sense, as was um, spoken about within the Maoist ideology in Nepal, that women are doubly oppressed through caste Mm -hmm. and through their, their gender. But sort of going back to the Indian context, we also have to remember that in the areas where Maoist activity is particularly prevalent, there is also issues around access to land that the state has actually imposed you know land restrictions or industry in areas where minority groups may actually live through subsistence living and therefore they're becoming more and more marginalized more and more excluded had more, uh, greater difficulties of access to to resources and those that are affected predominantly by that are as I say, those from SCST groups. So this would be one of the reasons behind it. But however, I suppose, you know, if we look at the figures of 40% of the female troops are from minority groups, but 90% of the martyrs. Now, I don't know the internal dynamics well enough to be able to give you a detailed response, but I suppose in order to progress to the central committee or to higher ranks and actually if we look at at who is in the higher ranks there are individuals of less marginalized groups of higher caste Mm. so there is a possibility of that discrimination within the insurgency itself and this is so often the case is that we look at the, the leadership of armed groups and they tend to come from more higher caste backgrounds or higher class backgrounds, shall I say, or, you know, if we look at, for example, Prachanda in Nepal, you know, he comes from a higher caste, he's educated, the same with Babram Bhattarai, who was the ideologue, better educated. We look to other contexts like uh, Peru, where Comrade Gozalo, who led the Shining Path, was a university professor. Mm. So there's this kind of intellectual leadership, which is all about being inclusive, but actually the way that that's enacted tends mm. to be a division of labor which still actually recreates some of those discriminations that they're trying to challenge ironically and I suppose yes more women from marginalized groups are in positions of foot soldiers and I suppose that has led to some of this uh, media coverage that would describe such women as human shields or you know in a really offensive manner cannon fodder I think they've been described as which is really problematic but at the same time the the way that that's covered now I'm not sure where those figures have have come from at the same time this has this a similar effect to this idea of we victimize women but we even more so victimize women of marginalized groups and then don't actually consider their own agency in participating and actually if you read some of the narratives from 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 women and I think Kasima um Shekawat I think is her name, and Chayanika Saxena, I think they did some excellent work on female Maoists in in India and did a number of interviews with them. And and some of the narratives really don't correspond to this notion of being the victim. And in fact, some of them talk about, I mean, unfortunately, a lot of women have to sort of prove themselves within armed groups. And I've very much found that in Nepal, I suppose, Mm -hmm. but also within their research, this kind of effort of really trying to prove yourself as the kind of biggest fighter and the most brutal fighter is a way of expressing that agency. And they, they also came across that in some of the narratives there. Sorry, I'm tangenting slightly, but anyway. <laughs> no, I think mean, that's really interesting, the concept that it's so counterintuitive that yeah. uh, you set out to fight the system, uh, namely, and then you recreate the same system completely blind to your own privilege. And so it's sort of like a very meta-narrative. You're building a world within the world, but even that alternative is not really 
banning out for people who are not from very privileged communities. And another thing that I find really interesting now that you bring that up is that even during my research, I found that women and just this concept of uh, you need to sort of kill your femininity to be respected, right? Like you need to be the most masculine version of yourself in an armed group as a woman so that you gain respect. And I mean, we have to discuss masculinity because that's the flip side of this coin if we're discussing gender in the red corridor. How does masculinity play out in this conflict? Like, we're talking about women so far, and especially like SCST women, but what does masculinity look like within the Red Corridor or even in Nepal and your own experience? More specifically, is it aligned with the progressive ideas? I suppose you already hinted that it doesn't, but uh, just to ask you more clearly, is it align with the progressive ideals that Maoism itself takes pride in or do men in the Red Corridor or other left or leading combatants still sort of quite entrenched in patriarchy? So that's an interesting question because I think, again, this is nuanced and it's not only the ideology itself, but we have to take into account the culture of uh, how notions of manhood are conceptualized within the community more generally uh, and how this then plays out within the armed group. Also, we have to take into account that within armed groups, as in any military, there is a role to, the, the, the role of command and control is also important. So where there is a strong command and control in place, this can in some ways regulate behaviours. And that also comes from the level of cohesion that there is within the group, how that command can actually be uh, um, effective. So ideology is one thing, but that is also interlinked with the kind of nature of the group itself and these ideas of intersecting ideologies from within society and, and, and from within the group. And in some ways, the ideology during a time of participation in the armed group is a kind of shift from what has been the norms in society but that doesn't necessarily just get forgotten as soon as men join an armed group but I suppose what I've found somewhat particularly in Nepal and I think it's still relevant in the Indian context is this idea of women having to prove themselves in order to be able to gain respect from their male counterparts and also this idea that I suppose um being the kind of ideal Maoist, the ideal male Maoist, can also come with ideas of, of, of actually being the progressive man. So mm. in some cases, the way that masculinity is in some ways performed and spoken about is around this idea of being progressive and, and, and therefore being more respectful of their female counterparts. I mean, certainly I found it in Nepal that the idea of promoting equality was kind of significant in how men understand themselves as the revolutionary man. And also the fact that seeing women in military positions where they hadn't necessarily seen them before taking on those positions was important in shifting that that mindset and although it's kind of problematic this idea of women having to prove themselves in order for men to gain that respect in some ways the act of actually having women present mm. in masculine roles however you know problematic this is actually did shift mind mindset somewhat mm. but i think there's a bit of a difference between the Nepali situation and, and, and the Indian situation. And I think it's possibly to do with the timing as well. Hmm. So in the early years, I suppose, of the, the Naxalites, shall we say, women participated, but in, in less numbers than what they were now. And I think if you look at some of the literature, there was a greater opposition to women's participation in the early days. But that... Um, over time, that was normalised much more. And so men's attitudes were much less in opposition to women's participation. And I, I did find that very much in Nepal as well. But I think if you look at some of the literature, th there is a lot of reports of internal 
the sexual violence and sexual harassment that takes place in the Indian context. I found less so, to be honest, in Nepal, although the, the, it, it did take place. But I, I think that part of that is to do with the length of time that an insurgency goes on for and that level of tight command and control. In Nepal, there's a much greater command and control system in, in place, which I think regulated behaviours is somewhat. And I think that that is the case to some extent in India, but maybe not always. I might just read you a little section of this uh, book by Saxena when she was speaking to an ex-combatant and she describes how they were made to perform tasks, including fighting during the day, but in the evenings that they were sometimes raped and beaten. Oh. Uh, so she says the extension of sexual favours to male combatants on many occasions is uh, ordered by the Naxal leaders as duty. That women are good fighters, but men are men. That there are certain needs of male combatants, and it is better for women to agree to fulfil those if solidarity is to maintain, said one male ex-combatant. And I found that quite shocking, because actually that's not the experience that I had uh, I've come across in other Maoist contexts. But it's a reality that takes place. So I think... At the same time, you look at shifting of masculinities to be more inclusive, and often that comes as a result of seeing women in those positions, but that these patriarchal values, particularly around sexual privilege, Mm. which we do see in society as well, also are perpetuated within armed groups. And actually, if we look at other conflicts, so for example, in Peru with the Shining Path, there was a lot of sexual violence carried out by members of the Shining Path, not not to the same extent as the state forces, but particularly as the conflict got more and more intense and, and I suppose, less controlled. So there's a number of different perspectives that we have to take, and it's very context-specific. Mm. And I think it's important to highlight those particularly negative points, but at the same time, we have to remember that the ideology may also shift positions on masculinity depending on the kind of the leadership at the time, I suppose. That actually reminds me of this one quote that I'd read by another ex-female combatant, which is, I think, Krishna Banopadhyay. And she basically expresses uh, that after spending, and she's a middle-class Indian woman from an upper-caste background, and she went into uh, the conflict from a very ideological point of view. And then after a spending a few years, she expresses that the overwhelming feeling that she just shifted from one patriarchal society to another. Nothing much had changed in terms of how women were treated. In terms of, like you described, there's still sexual violence within the cadres. It's not like it magically stops the moment Mm. you become a female Maoist. And that actually bleeds into this overall point that I make in my paper, which is that there is so much gap that the state has left up until now. Social economic gap in terms of sexual assault and just overall women's you know, status in society not being very great. And Maoism at least acknowledges that, right? It, it sort of extends a piece, you know, a branch and says, here we acknowledge that all of these are issues for you and that female issues are a little more distinct than male issues and you suffer to a greater extent and the layers of privilege that we have, you don't have. But that is not to say that those layers magically vanish the moment Mm. that you're in. So I think that there is a lot of scope for the state to re-enter this negotiation with female Mao, especially because they do form such huge numbers and they sustain the revolution in terms of they cook, they clean, they fight, you know, apart from just being leadership, they're essentially the foundation of this movement and this movement wouldn't exist without them. So do you think if the state adopts more gender sensitive policies, let's say, and it genuinely acknowledges that there is this problem, do you think it it would be more effective than more hard power security responses that the state is taking. Yeah, yeah definitely. Can I just go back on one point that, that you made around women being in the support positions of doing the cook and doing the cleaning and doing all these support positions? I think while that's often true, 
it's it's really important to remember that's not, not the only roles I play and right. also the men are also in those positions and that's one thing I found very much in in Nepal is that a lot of w- women that I spoke to were actually quite you know they had actually some quite good memories of participation and one of the things was around courtesan life where men and women would actually be doing the cooking together within mm-hmm. the camps and that was um hugely i suppose influential in in shifting those gender roles within the time of conflict shall we say and i think that when we look at any analysis of conflict we have to go beyond just looking at the fighting just right. looking at actual combat we have to look at the social dynamics within the group itself much more but yes certainly going back to this issue of the responses to armed conflict by the state I think the, the, what this hard power approach is particularly mm-hmm. problematic. One of the problems with the current approach by the state is the way that the Maoists are defined in a sense as kind of internal terrorists and this in a sense legitimizes the kind of hard power crackdown um against them which um has resulted in harms against individuals high numbers um uh, of deaths in custody high num- numbers of sexual violence are carried out against women uh, in custody women maoists which of course is hugely problematic and any sort of approach in this manner is not going to quell the discontent which is the root causes of such violence and some of the root causes of women's participation in fact this is not going to contribute to a long term uh, solution and we could say you know in in a sort of comparative context in sri lanka where the government entirely um, destroyed the ltte in the final assault back in 2009 which not only caused up a you know, huge amount of devastation of, of of the combatants but the civilian population as well and so to try and actually build peace on the back of a situation which has a particular group has been you know the main target of, of those sorts of violence will it may quash it for a short period of time but that discontent is always going to be there within society amongst certain groups mm-hmm. my point is that you know this hard power approach in india causes greater resentment against the state and actually sort of reinforces particularly in terms of violence against women and violence against um female maoist members it can reinforce inequality and some of these root causes of where participation has come from and also even the way that maoist men are targeted by the state also mm. has an impact on women within their families because it may be a son who is the the main breadwinner winner for the family the, the son may be in an auxiliary role for example in you know intelligence or whatever is targeted by the state is taken away the impact on the family the hardship often falls into the realm of of, of the woman or the mother or the sister yeah. or whatever uh, has you know devastating impact so beyond just directly targeting women as one of the problematic elements of this approach just the way that this hard power approach impacts on um the civilian population and women in the civilian population more generally is hugely problematic and it furthers this kind of sense of um, exclusion i mean i suppose at the international level there is much more of a drive to uh, implement a more gender sensitive conflict analysis in mm. counterinsurgency measures and this is something i really think that the indian state needs to adopt or needs to take more seriously i mean i suppose this idea with international women's day that they were celebrating you know some certain women from the ranks yeah. and how much is that uh, you know covering all of the other abuses that are taking place that might be one approach which is you know all glitzy sort of media attention and and all that and focused yeah. around international women's day but we're not looking at the bigger structural issues around violence against women more generally in society and beyond direct violence but also structural violence which really perpetuates this uh, dissatisfaction and perpetuates fi- armed violence in the community
Yeah, I, I think that's really interesting that you bring that up because even if you're not part of the Maoist cadres, and as a woman, I think the onus of not only protecting yourself in terms of security, and you're always, you know, as a woman, you're always alert to threats against yourself, especially in the red corridor, I imagine. But also this more gendered role of women being the caretakers. So I was reading this human rights report by I think the Human Rights Watch, and it mentioned how a majority of the times when men were arrested or uh, illegally detained, or you know there was a fake encounter or something of that sort, it was predominantly women who showed up to speak to the police, and then they would again face a lot of harassment in the police station, so on and so forth. It's it's this double bind that women are in, even if they're not part of the conflict in terms of actively being part of the conflict, they still face so many backlash from just even leading a normal life, which I think, like you mentioned, creates this loop where even if you don't want to join the revolution for whatever person causes, you push to that brink by the level of discrimination, by the level of uh, sexism even and misogyny and just losing your family members, you know, at a rapid rate that I, I think there's a quote which I read which said that, you know, they killed my brother in a fake encounter. They sexually harassed my sister. I had no, quote, unquote, I had no uh, choice but to join the revolution. And it's this sense of, you don't have to demean the incentive. Right? I think currently the state response to all these things is, no, it doesn't exist. Or, no, patriarchy doesn't exist. Like, for example, patriarchy doesn't exist in normal India, but within the Maoist cadres, there's so much patriarchy that women are not in leading positions. But but that can be said for so many parts of India and the rest of the world. So I think to dismiss that um, is not the point. Do you think that there is something to be said for hard power response to some degree in combat situations because you've read, you, you know, so many different sort of in Nepal and Peru in Sri Lanka and even India? Or do you think it inevitably boils down to genuine good policies, which would not immediately put out the fire of a revolution, but in the long term, it addresses a lot of the incentives and to sort of put a damper on that and say, okay, we'll educate you. Okay, we'll make sure you're involved in the rural economy. We'll make sure there are adequate mechanisms in, in place for you to even address sexual violence. Where are you leaning on this? So there's a number of issues, I suppose. You have to look at the structural uh, situation uh, more broadly, I think, to look at those root causes of conflict. And I think with any conflict, you you know, if you don't address the root causes, then you're only putting a, a stick in plaster across the mm-hmm. conflict and, it, and it's just going to sit there. But also we have to remember that there are numerous initiatives, particularly with women's groups, civil society groups, who are pushing for peace. And as part of that, they are the key kind of interlocutors shall I say or there are possibilities for that dialogue to be hugely instrumental in bringing peace because unless you listen to the voices of those individuals on the ground if the state listens to those individuals on the ground naturally it takes into account those grievances then you can start a process of dialogue And, and I think that without dialogue And that dialogue needs to be inclusive of all groups. It needs to be inclusive of of women. Then you're not going to be able to resolve such long-standing antagonisms. So this idea of just using hard power is, is ineffective. Now, this is not to say there isn't any role for, you know, security and whatever. But if that isn't done in parallel with using methods of dialogue, then it's going nowhere in the long run. But I suppose going back to also what you were saying around the impact of these policies on women and how women disproportionately suffer as a result of counterinsurgency measures. I mean, this was one of the 
major reasons in Nepal, one of the major reasons for many of the women that I spoke to, that there was a huge fear of sexual violence being carried out against them by the state in the counterinsurgency. Women spoke about the greatest fear was to be captured by the state because inevitably that would involve some form of, of torture. But also this notion of women are the centre of the community because they're kind of seen in this sort of domestic space, shall I say, that a, a way of punishing men in the community is often yeah. to cause violence or, or, or to cause shame on your family through harm against women. And this mm-hmm. takes place by the state. We have to realise that this is a state institution which is supposed to be promoting values of inclusion, but within counterinsurgency, this certainly takes place, is punishing the family for the participation of a child. And the target will be so often would be the woman in, it, in, in the family. So, you know, again, any kind of hard power counterinsurgency measures are often so gendered. And of course, you know, armed groups work in the same way. If you're targeting a particular community, if we're targeting a community that often, you know, women are some of those that are particularly targeted because they're in a sense representing a particular identity. So uh, really, in order to challenge this, we have to challenge our assumptions about how we perceive women the idea that they are just the victim and that they are, in a sense, the holders of family honour. The idea of of the family, that the institution of marriage, unfortunately, in in many cases, is problematic in terms of the way that... I'm not not, not saying (laughs) marriage is a bad thing, but the way that it's actually construed in society often is around, you know, issues of honour, or constructs constraints around women and what they do. I mean, if we look at a lot of the women participants in armed groups, or particularly Maoist armed groups, they tend to come younger to be un- unmarried, at least when they join. But as, as what I found in Nepal is that those that were targeted by motivators to come and join the group, mm. they, they were targeting young women that were not married, because in a sense, there was this kind of patriarchal control already associated with women that were that were married so you know there's all these different institutions that really need to be examined in order to shift these structural dynamics which i suppose perpetuate harms against women more generally and minorities that's really interesting i didn't know that they particular i thought that was just something that they said in propaganda but i didn't know this was a real thing but i actually remember reading something along the lines of women are controlled in Maoist groups to the point where they're often there are accounts of women having to go through forced abortions or really like restraints on their sexuality as women in terms of you can't have relations with your uh, male counterparts or you know just really odd sort of understanding of sexuality which really struck me because for a progressive movement I think incorporating progressive ideas on sexuality is also sort of a big part of it, uh, especially if you talk about gender dynamics. So how does that work? Is this like a very cognizant thought that you bring in young women who are not yet controlled in a Mm. a marital setting, but then you bring them in and then you just go the other way completely and you don't even let them have agency over their own body? Yeah, that's an interesting one. And I think certain armed groups have different policies on sexuality. The, L- the LTTE, for example, had extreme control over the bodies of individuals and sexual relations was not allowed at all. So that was another reason for why they had male and female battalions, that they weren't mixed groups. In Nepal, a lot of young cadre would have married during the, the conflict and there was they encouraged inter-caste marriage as part of a demonstration mm-hmm. of challenging the caste system as part of the ideal. But what was interesting is that they normally after marriage, which had to be approved by the party, 
they stationed the husband and wife in separate locations. So they were allowed to meet, you know, for certain periods of, uh, of time, but that was the general policy. And part of that was that childbirth was the biggest impediment to women's emancipation, as it was stated. But m- many women did give birth during the conflict and, and they were allowed maternity leave, although some women in their narratives were determined to go, go straight back to the, to the battlefield. And the leadership encouraged young women who gave birth to leave the child with the masses or with a family member. So there are numerous examples of women who gave birth during the conflict and left their child with maybe their mother or others. But certainly abortions would have taken place and would not have been approved of. And in other contexts, yes, women have, and I think, I I don't, I'm not entirely sure, but I think there has been reports definitely in the Indian context of women being encouraged to have an um, abortion, to be able to continue their career within the mass. So there is this level of control over sexuality, which it can be very much part of Maoist thinking within with armed, armed groups in a sense it's this idea that within the propaganda it's, it's often around the emancipation of women and i think what you've been spoken about before is this ambivalent emancipation that the, the women are emancipated as being part of an armed group being able to display what was seen as masculine qualities and and, yeah. and whatever but they are still restricted in some way have they still are, are, have imposed restrictions on the body much more so than men. As that quote that I read to you before, right. you know, unbelievably kind of still has this attitude that, you know, men need to yeah. be pleased sort of thing. So that's sort of naturally acceptable. And it's this idea about what's natural. I suppose, you know. That's such a warped understanding of gender, I think, especially because it makes me wonder, like, of course, I think the more we talk, the more I, I get the sense that At least right now, I mean, I can't speak to the entire experience, but from what I gather, it's that emancipation, we will tell women what emancipation is for them, but really emancipation means the the freedom to choose. And so even choosing to have children is emancipation if it comes from your own free will, which alludes to the fact that the more masculine uh, women become uh, to men that translates to being freer because that's their understanding maybe but mm-hmm. that also makes you wonder to what degree are men encouraged to be feminine is that a conversation that's been had it's, pr- it's problematic isn't it I mean if you look at the literature you know where where women kind of display uh, masculine traits that can in certain circumstances, particularly in conflict, can garner them respect. You know, and if I think about some of the comments by male Maoists in in the Nepali situation, because they were amazed that a woman could carry a gun. You know, the statements like, I never thought that women would be able to carry a gun. We always thought it would bring bad luck, but now I can see them in the battlefield. Now we can respect them. Now we can see that they're equally capable. So Mm. we can see how this shifts thinking. But when men take on feminine roles, that is often seen as a situation of of ridicule in a way. Mm. Now, in in a military context, when men participate in cooking and cleaning, it's part of that military environment. So in a sense, that's often seen as acceptable. If I think about my research in in Nepal, where after the, the peace agreement was signed, the Maoist former combatants were housed for six years in cantonments. If you look at the dynamics between what was going on inside the cantonment and outside, where men were often married during the, the, the cantonment period, and when women would give birth, they would often leave, so they'd maybe be staying in the periphery mm. and uh, outside of the actual barracks or cantonments themselves. But men would be involved in all the cooking and cleaning in the cantonments because it's the military environment. But when they leave to come home or to come to visit the wife, there's an expectation that the wife takes on that role. So the different environment itself can create a kind of acceptability of what roles it's okay for men to take on, in a sense. And so we need to sort of problematize that, you know, what is acceptable for a man to do because it's very 
difficult to shift those notions when society instills a, a sense of what is the ideal man. Mm. And these are masculine behaviours that tend to be valued over women's, the idea that men are active and uh, that men are in the public sphere. And that needs to be challenged if you're going to shift anything in terms of gender relations. It can't always just lie with women who've got to do this and da 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 men actually have to engage in that conversation as yeah. well. So it's shifting the value, I suppose, the value systems that, that are associated with what we define as masculine and feminine. Let's zoom out a little bit from India and discuss women combatants in South Asia. I know that your research is predominantly based in Nepal and insurgency in India is just a puzzle piece in the overall debate. Uh, could you shed a little light on women's inclusion in Maoist insurgency in South Asia as a whole and how it sits in relation to more global debates on women in armed groups. Yeah, well, I suppose I could start by saying there's an assumption around the, the notion of women in armed groups that it's something extraordinary, that women actually don't participate in armed groups very much, and when they do, they're coerced, or when they do, they're only in auxiliary positions. But, of course, that's not a reality, and, and I think the biggest examples of a challenge to that reality is within Maoist or Marxist conflicts, because we see the same in Latin America, for example, when the Sandinistas, for example, high numbers of women in, in the ranks, many of the, the Latin American conflicts, like, as I was talking about earlier, the Shining Path in Salvador, for example, high numbers of women. And that's often within armed groups that have a kind of, should we say, a, a, a kind of bottom-up uprising which is based on inequalities. And actually, I suppose I should bring in this concept by Elizabeth Wood, where she talks about the kind of peasant uprising in, in El Salvador, which led to the change in, in, in the dynamics in, in, in El Salvador during the 1980s, 19, early 90s. She says that, that those that have been oppressed, that they've had their agency somewhat curtailed, and therefore participation in an armed group that is going to challenge that inequality or that marginalization comes with having a, a pleasure in agency, she calls it pleasure in agency. So it's about exerting that agency. And I think that's an important point to, to make that that often, the, 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 the choice to participate in challenging the state, particularly in those groups that represent a challenge to the state comes from that perspective. And that also matters for women as well. But more broadly, women participate in Oh, the whole spectrum of armed groups, it's not only focused on left-wing armed groups, which, although they participate in high numbers, we have to remember that women are also perpetrators of extreme violence in very conservative groups as well. I mean, we only have to look at foreign fighters within extreme fundamentalist groups in the Middle East that, you know, these conservative ideological groups also include women. There is the kind of sense that and it's you know accurate it's somewhat that actually including women in an armed group does something for the image of the armed group and also mm -hmm. instrumentally that women can often go undercover much easier than men so that sort of accounts for the increase in women suicide bombers for example using young girls as suicide bombers because they tend to go un unnoticed so that instrumentality of how women can be utilized by an armed group in different ways but depending on the context so i suppose my point is that women participate in armed group across the whole spectrum of different ideologies although to a different extent so the idea that women are peaceful and men are violent really is challenged by that reality and the reality that women are not necessarily all coerced into armed groups, that they actually act on their own agency. Now, that doesn't mean to say that there won't be any indirect coercion or, or indirect reasons for that taking place, but some of those reasons are pretty much the same as men's. So we have to challenge this idea of women as victims and men as, as perpetrators as a standard. And I'm not saying that, you know, obviously women are predominantly the targets of gender-based violence and men are predominantly the perpetrators. But we have to reconfigure how we think about perceptions around victimization of women that actually prevent somewhat agency, I suppose, that um, you know, perpetuates these norms. So, yeah. <laughs> I think that's a perfect place for us to close.
Dr. Heidi, thank you for all your valuable insights and all the research that you've shared with us today. I eagerly look forward, as you know, to your book release later this year. And uh, I thank all our listeners for tuning into another episode of The Policy Room. Thank you for tuning into another episode of Policy Room, produced by the Social and Political Research Foundation. SPRF is a youth-oriented public policy think tank based in New Delhi, working to spark dialogues for a better democracy. Stay tuned for more episodes coming soon.